On the eve of our struggle for independence, a man who might have been one of the greatest among the founding fathers, Dr. Joseph Warren, president of the Massachusetts Congress, said to his fellow Americans, our country is in danger, but not to be despaired of. On you depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the important question which, upon which rests the happiness and the liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. Well, I believe we, the Americans of today, are ready to act worthy of ourselves. Ready to do what must be done to ensure happiness and liberty for ourselves, our children, and our children's children. From time to time, we've been tempted to believe that society has become too complex to be managed by self-rule, that government by an elite group is superior to government for, by, and of the people. We are a nation that has a government, not the other way around. And this makes us special among the nations of the earth. Our government has no power except that granted it by the people. It is made up of men and women who raise our food, patrol our streets, man our mines and factories, teach our children, keep our homes, and heal us when we're sick. Professionals, industrialists, shopkeepers, clerks, cabbies, and truck drivers. They are, in short, we the people. Their patriotism is quiet but deep. Their values sustain our national life. With the idealism and fair play, which are the core of our system and our strength, we can have a strong and prosperous America at peace with itself and the world. So with all the creative energy at our command, let us begin an era of national renewal. Let us renew our determination, our courage, and our strength. And let us renew our faith and our hope. It is time for us to realize that we're too great a nation to limit ourselves to small dreams. We will again be the exemplar of freedom and a beacon of hope for those who do not now have freedom. We are a nation under God, and I believe God intended for us to be free. Good morning, welcome to worship today. We are glad you are here. We invite you to make your presence known by making a comment. Those wishing to make an online offering to help support our mission and ministry can do so by going to www.wnumc.com and following the instructions posted there. During the month of July, we will be collecting school supplies for our annual backpack giveaway for West Newton Elementary. The items we are needing are listed in both the bulletin and the July newsletter. If you would prefer to give a monetary donation toward this important mission, that would be awesome too. Our backpack giveaway will be held on July 24th from 10 to 12. If you are interested in volunteering for that event, please call the office and let us know. On July 25th, we have invited Mrs. LeMay and the staff of West Newton Elementary to be present with us during the service to offer up prayers for the new school year. We hope you will join us for that. Will you please stand and join me for our morning prayer? Almighty God, you rule all the peoples of the earth. Inspire the minds of all women and men to whom you have committed the responsibility of government and leadership in the nations of the world. Give to them the vision of truth and justice, that by their counsel, all nations and peoples may work together. Give to the people of our country zeal for justice and strength of forbearance, that we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will. Forgive our shortcomings as a nation. Purify our hearts to see and love the truth. We pray all these things through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now we're going to sing. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now descends. You stood before my face. 
I'm going to invite the boys and girls to come forward at this time. And I'm really glad they're here so I don't have to just talk into thin air, even though I know that there are going to be boys and girls that are watching this. So first of all, let me just say thank you for being here. Um, I have a question for you. When you come into the church, do you feel welcome? Yeah. Um, I always feel welcome when I come here. Um, you know, there are times, though, uh, when Jesus, well, there was a specific time in Jesus' ministry when he did not feel welcome. And believe it or not, it was when he went home. And he, when he went home to his own synagogue, his own church, and he went up to uh, teach that day, people made fun of him. Have you ever been someplace where somebody's made fun of you? I have. Some of the times I like it because I'm trying to be funny, but then some of the times I'm trying to be serious and somebody makes fun of me, it hurts my feelings. I'm pretty sure that Jesus didn't particularly like the fact that people were making fun of him. But you know what? The bigger issue was this. They didn't have faith. And because they didn't have faith, he couldn't do any miracles. Isn't that interesting? You know, because in some ways I would think God could do a miracle no matter what, right? But here's something to think about. Let's say I mail you a letter every day, and inside the letter is $100. Every day, for a month, I mail you $100. So at the end of the month, you're rich, right? But 
if you never open the envelope when it comes and you just throw it in the trash, are you going to be rich at the end of the month? No. And see, that's what God's miracles are like. God wants us to live in the miraculous, but instead of having our, our, our arms open waiting for the miracles, we're kind of like this, eh, never mind. And that's what those people did in that synagogue. They were like, mm, who are you? You're nobody special. And so they couldn't receive the miracles. So if we want to receive the miraculous, we have to be open with our faith. Now, don't get any ideas that I'm going to start sending you $100 bills. I mean, if I had the money, I would do it, but I don't. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you for that reminder that we have to be open and we have to be willing to have faith to receive your miracles. And Lord, I just ask that you help us do that. And it's in your precious name we pray these things. Amen. Thanks, guys. You can go back to your seats. I really am glad that you are joining us this morning. Um, I want to offer up some, uh, a little bit of a report at least on some of the people that we've been praying for. Um, Reverend Deb had her surgery on Monday and she did really, really well. And so I would ask that you continue to keep her in your, your prayers as she continues to heal. Um, and also I would ask for healing um, and prayers for uh, Carol Stum. Um, and so as we get ready to pray this morning, I'm going to have our worship team call us to prayer, and then I'm going to give you some time to talk to Jesus. Oh, Father God, we thank you for this time together. Even though many of us are worshiping virtually today, we know that when two or more are gathered in your name, you are there. We thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit. Father, you are such a good Good Father, you give us only good gifts. And Father, I just ask that we can be open to the miraculous, open to the things that you want to give us. And Lord, I, I just pray that you will pour out on us wisdom and revelation so that we can know you more and that we can be more like you. We thank you, Lord, for this Independence Day where we can live in a land that is free. And Father, on this day, we pray for our leaders, Lord. We pray that they make good decisions and we ask, Lord, that they seek after your will. And Lord, as we remember the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, 
we lift our voices together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, church, if we were worshiping together, this would be the time that we would be giving back to God his tithes and our offerings. But uh, we're still going to sing. And so I'd like you to join me um, as we sing God of the Ages. Join me in singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly Let's pray together. Father, you have blessed us so mightily. Help us be worthy of that blessing. And as we give back to you, Lord, we just ask that your tithes and our offerings go to the advancement of your kingdom. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your precious name we pray these things. Amen. Well, I am really glad that you are here with us today. Um, as we worship together today, it seems appropriate that the sermon title is There's No Place Like Home, since most of you are probably worshiping from home, maybe even in your jammies. Or maybe you're worshiping from the place where you're on vacation. Or maybe you're just worshiping sometime later on in the week, whenever, however, where ever you are worshiping we are really glad that you are joining with us you know today in the united states we are celebrating independence day and um it's usually the day that we as a nation we spend a lot of time watching fireworks uh, go off to fill the sky it's also a day that we spend um eating our fair share of hot dogs and probably large quantities of 
potato salad. Um, but probably more than anything else about the 4th of July is that we get to spend time with family and friends. Um, and I remember a time when I was a little girl, maybe one of my most favorite 4th of July's I ever spent was when several of my cousins who lived throughout the Midwest came home to visit my grandparents and we celebrated the 4th of July together. I was a lucky girl that I grew up right next to my grandparents. So when our cousins came, we got to spend a lot of time together. And that particular 4th of July, we decided we we're going to have a 4th of July parade. And we made costumes and floats, if you would consider a red flyer wagon a float, but that's what we did. And we, ha we dressed up my younger cousin as the Statue of Liberty, and my younger brother's name is Sam, so he was the official, you know, Uncle Sam. And even though none of my cousins had grown up in my hometown, th their mothers all had. And so I really feel like they enjoyed coming together um, in their hometown. Um, I think they may have felt maybe a little bit like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz with her ruby red slippers when she clicked them together and said, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. And why is it that home has that almost magnetic pull for us? Even, you know, in, when it's the best times or the worst times, we want to be home. And maybe it's because, um, you know, the poet Robert Frost wrote, home is the place where, when you go home, they have to take you in. But in our story from the Gospel of Mark today, that may not have been the case for Jesus. And when Jesus goes home, the reaction, mm, it's not really what we might have expected. So this is Mark 6 verses 1 through 6. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their own hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went among the villages teaching. Now in that very first verse that we read out of the sixth chapter of Mark, it said Jesus left that place. And if you remember from last week's lesson in Mark, the place that he left was Galilee. And so he was going from Galilee to Nazareth. And Nazareth was about a mini marathon days uh, away. So in other words, it was like 13 and a half miles away from Nazareth, which that sounds like a lot to me, but honestly, a, a typical biblical walk, a, a, tip, a typical biblical journey was 20 miles. So 13 and a half miles really wasn't um, that big of a deal. Now, why did Jesus go home? We don't really know. I mean, I'm kind of guessing that he might have just been physically exhausted, tired. He just sort of needed a place to go uh, to rest, because you remember he was literally mobbed everywhere he went. But it could have mean that he just had been away from home, just like when we're uh, away from home for a long time, we just really want to go home and have a soft place to land. Or maybe Jesus was going home to do a little fence building. You remember a few chapters back when his brothers came and they were going to do an intervention, and they called him crazy. So maybe he was going to try to make amends with them. I don't know. We don't know why he went home. We just know that he went. 
But when he goes, he definitely gets this mixed reaction uh, to him when he goes into the synagogue to teach. Now, let's remember that at this part of the story, this point of the story, Jesus has already had tremendous success preaching all over the place. The crowds are just following him everywhere. Um, in fact, he hardly had time to eat or to sleep. And now he's taken time away from these big crowds, and he, and he heads home to his hometown synagogue. And when he gets up to preach, the people are equally, equal parts, amazed and skeptical. They're amazed and skeptical. Now, first, Mark tells us that people were astounded. They were astounded. They were asking questions like, oh, how did this guy get so knowledgeable? Where's all this coming from? How did he get all so powerful? And then that astonishment soon turns to confusion. They're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't he grow up here? How is it that he's, you know, all of a sudden he's Mr. Know-it-all, I can heal people with my bare hands, man. I think it might be kind of like, you know, if you went to your class reunion and you'd gone to school with Mother Teresa and you saw her and you'd be like, wait, didn't we have third period lunch together? I don't remember you handing out food then. But then the confusion kind of turns ugly. It begins to turn to insults. And they refer to Jesus as the son of Mary. Now, in our 21st century Western culture, we don't really get the nuances of that, but that's really kind of an insult. Because it may have been a jab at his parental legitimacy. You see, young men were usually identified by their father. So instead of calling him Bar Joseph, which would have meant son of Joseph, they called him Mary's son. And when somebody was identified by their mother, it usually meant one of two things. Either the father was unknown or he wasn't Jewish. And then they go on to name all of his brothers. And then they mention that his sisters were right there with him. And they're like, he's nobody special. He's one of us. Who does he think he is anyway? And they become offended. They become offended. And because of their unbelief, Jesus was unable to do very many miracles there. Now, I want you to contrast that with our story from last week when he was in Galilee. Do you remember? He healed a woman who had been suffering for 12 years with a debilitating disease of a hemorrhage bleeding for 12 years, and he had raised from the dead a child. Seriously, what? What? What was the difference here? And I'm telling you, the difference was just one word. Faith. The difference was faith. The people who received those miracles in Galilee had faith. They spoke their faith, and they acted on their faith. And if we want to live our lives in the miraculous, we have to learn the language of faith. Proverbs 18.21 is super clear that our words have the power of life and death. Life and death, church. And this is what's so mind-blowing to me. It is very likely that the situation, whatever conditions that you are living in right now, are the results of yesterday's words. Whatever condition you are living your life in is most likely the result of yesterday's words. And we have to learn to speak life instead of death over ourselves 
and others. And speaking faith is more than just having a positive attitude. It's believing that God really is going to come through with the things that he promises us. And church, if you are having trouble speaking the language of faith, I want you to listen really carefully now. If you are having trouble speaking the language of faith, then you need to learn to practice the language of silence. If you cannot speak, speak faith over a situation, you need to practice the language of silence. Because until you learn to speak life-giving words, practicing the vocabulary of silence keeps you from speaking death, negativity into your life. Because the truth is this, whatever comes out of your mouth is either going to be for good or for evil. It's going to reap a harvest for good or for evil. You may know the importance of words. I do believe most of us really know the importance of words. But do you practice the intentionality of speaking life? Are you speaking the language of life and faith? Jesus could do no big deed of miracle in that place, in his hometown of Nazareth, because people could not speak faith. They could only speak doubt. They could only speak insults. And their faithlessness stole their opportunity for the miraculous. So that's the first thing that we have to do is that we have to speak the vocabulary of faith. And if we haven't learned to do that yet, then we need to learn the language of silence. The second thing is, is that we have to put our faith into action. We cannot just sit around and hope that something's going to come to pass. You can't believe something and then not act on it. You have to act on it as if it has already happened. Both miraculous instances in that fifth chapter of Mark happened because those people acted on their faith. They spoke faith. You remember that the woman with the issue of blood, she said to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I'm going to be healed. And then, what did she do? She touched his clothes. So she had the language of faith, and then she had the action of faith. Jairus' daughter, who died, he had the, the language of faith. He says, I know that you can, you can heal her. And then he had the action of faith. He went and got Jesus, and he took him to his daughter. We have to take action and continue to pursue Jesus. In the meantime, you know, several years ago when I was serving another church, I went before the body and I asked the body to help me pray for a miracle. And when I asked them to pray for the miracle, I said, you know, like, I know this is totally up to God's will and his timing. And whether or not he chooses to answer this prayer with a miraculous outpouring, it doesn't matter because I'm going to continue to praise him anyway. Um, and several months later, a woman in that congregation came up to me and she said, you know what, I, what you said in church uh, the other day about asking God for something, that really stuck with me. And I, <laughs> I have to kind of admit, I wasn't sure which incident she was talking about because I asked God for a lot of things. And, but then she continued and she said, you know, when you said that even if the miracle didn't happen, that you would keep praising God, that changed me. Oh, church, I was so humbled. I was so humbled. You know, the miracle that I had been praying for had not happened. It didn't happen the way I thought it was going to be. But I know that that doesn't change who God is. And it certainly didn't change who I was to God. So I was going to continue to praise him despite whether I got the miracle 
that I asked for. And if we are following in the example of the people who got healed, if we're following the example of being humbly submitted, biblically formed disciples of Jesus Christ, then we have to pursue Jesus as we continue to believe. So, what happened after Jesus went home, but home didn't take him in? You know, if, if that would have happened to me, I would have really gotten my feelings hurt. I would have. I would have been so, so sad, and I'd have felt so, so sorry for myself, and I would have thought, why can't you see me for who I am now, this grown-up lady, instead of, you know, the little girl that used to hide behind her mother's skirt? We all want to be welcomed home, don't we? We all want to feel like we belonged. And being home is wrapped up in our desire to be welcomed and to be loved. And if your own home won't take you, what's left? Well, if you're Jesus, what did he do? What did he do when home no longer proved to be an emotionally safe and welcoming place? According to Mark, he went on in his ministry. He went out and he taught in other villages. In fact, he sent out his disciples two by two to be forerunners in the ministry, going into the different villages. He sent them. He said, um, okay, I want you to, to preach the good news. I want you to, you're going to have power over the demonic spirits. And you're going to be able to heal people. And this is what he told them in Mark 6, verses 10 and 11. He said, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. And that's what they did. And then following up then in Mark 6, verses 12 and 13, it continues in saying, So they went out, and they proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. What's left when you've left home? Or worse, <laughs> home's left you. Well, if you're Jesus... You make a new home. You make a new home. Jesus sent his disciples out to make new homes with new relationships. He wanted them to rely on the people that they stayed with, and he wanted them to preach the good news and to, and to build relationships with those people that they went to. Because Jesus knew, and he knows now, that home, it's not necessarily a place but home is really, you find home in the relationships that you form. Jesus was always concerned with relationships. He's concerned with our relationship with him, and he's concerned with the relationships that we have with other people. And he uses us to do ministry within the relationships that we form. He couldn't do any Miracles, he didn't do very many miracles in his hometown because nobody would enter into relationship with him. You know, Jesus tells us that our true home is the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is all about relationships. It's a commitment to love one another. And to have compassion for one another just as Jesus loves us and has compassion on us. And in this weary world that we're in, Jesus really is our soft spot to land. He's the home where we're always welcome. And when it comes to Jesus, there really is no place like home. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the example that you give us in your just unbelievable, beautiful son, Jesus. 
that when he was rejected, he went on and he found home in the relationships that he could form elsewhere. Lord, I just pray that within our own relationships, use us, use us, Lord, to advance the kingdom of God and to glorify you. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your precious name we pray these things. Amen. Church, today we're going to participate in communion by using the great thanksgiving. It is a, a type of liturgy that is found in our book of worship. It's found in our hymnal, and it's really very rich in uh, meaning. And um, I really would like to start using the great thanksgiving each month. And so we're going to start today with the great thanksgiving. And I want you to understand that we're not just reading these words. I want you to be in the attitude of prayer because we are going to be praying these words to the Lord. So the Lord be with you. And, and also, also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them, them up, up to the, the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to, to give, give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord God, God of power and might, and might. Heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and he gave thanks to you and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us. Gather here and virtually, Lord, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast his heavenly banquet through your son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in your holy church all honor and glory is yours almighty father now and forever amen, amen. amen. this is the body of Christ broken for you
This is the blood of the lamb poured out for you. I'd invite those that are here to come forward at this time to receive communion. body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of the Lamb poured out for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of the Lamb poured out for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of the Lamb poured out for you. I would invite you to join with me as we sing our final song today.
church this week, learn to speak the language of faith and expect the miraculous. Go now in the love, the mercy, the peace and grace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen.